Welcome everybody to the Beers and Bible Podcast. My name is Josh, and I'm joined by good friend Gabe. Gabe, how are you on this beautiful, beautiful evening? Doing well, doing well. It's, it's rainy and stormy here in southern Alabama, so I guess mm. beauty is in the, uh, the eye of the, the world. On a rainy, rainy and stormy night, do you feel like you need to be curling up with a a good hardcover book and a cup of tea mm. and like Chopin music? Do you remember um, in the background that scene from The Office where it's raining outside and all of the office workers are like? I guess I guess um, Jim Halpert made this thing where he would buy everybody hot chocolate in the office. If uh, what's her name? Uh, Phyllis, if Phyllis went through and said a list of things that she always says when it's raining, it's like 12 things she always says when it's raining outside. <laughs> and if she goes through all those things by noon, then Jim would buy everybody hot chocolate in the office. Um, mm. But one of, one of them was like, when it's raining out, like Phyllis goes, when it's raining outside, it just makes me want to curl up on a couch and read a good book. <laughs> there's like, then there's like, a, oh, we really needed this. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I find myself yeah, saying that anyways. quite a bit as a dad. Yeah, as a dad, I'm yeah. like obsessed with my grass. My grass is like mm-hmm. my uh, my happy place out there on my zero turn mower. So when it doesn't yeah. rain, I get really upset because that means I'm not gonna be able to mow. So it's crazy. Well, that's how good, man. I remember like in in my 20s, I remember my next door neighbor was obsessed with his lawn, and I was like anything but obsessed with my lawn. It was like it was it was horrendous. I felt I felt really bad, but. I was like, I would never be like that guy that cares about his lawn. And <laughs> I kid you not, like last week I was out with an edger and like a pair of scissors. And I was like, I was getting that mm. thing. Like, you know, like it was like dizzy on ice up in my front yard. Yes. And I was like, what Pristine am I working I, conditions? I'm, what am I turning into here? <laughs> <laughs> Do you have white new balances that you wear when you work out in the lawn? Not yet. Okay. Well, I'm not, I haven't reached gift. that stage of, I haven't reached that stage of not caring. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I'm almost there. Especially when I start working the grill and the smoker. Mm. Those dad vibes come out mm-hmm. quite a bit. So, yeah. Growing old's fun. Yeah, it is. It is. You just yeah. care less your... and less. <laughs> Somebody was telling me they were they had just turned 30. And they were like, what's it like being in your 30s? I was like, well, any delusion you had that you were cool... By the time you hit thirty, you just you just don't care anymore. Like you realize you're you're not cool. And the one mm-hmm. the people that tried to be cool into their thirties, those people are called pathetic. And the people that just accept that they're not and they probably never will be, are the people that end up actually being kind of cool because you're like, yeah, you're just yourself and you're comfortable in your own skin. So I think your thirties are a good decade to just kind of embrace the fact that you're not cool and you don't really care if people think you are you're not and it's great and then as your kids get older you embarrass the snot out of them and it's awesome that's a whole new level of fun yeah i went to the gym this morning and i went to the gym this morning i started doing pull-ups like right away you know like first thing like right out the shoot i'm like i'm gonna knock out some pull-ups and i just start doing pull-ups and i hop off the pull-up bar after i'm done and i'm like panting i'm like hyperventilating my heart's pounding and I just developed this, like, immediately, like, this, developed this splitting headache on the right side of my head. And I'm like, oh, no. I'm done. Peace, y'all. I'm, it was, like, <laughs> awful. And I was like, man, I am not in my 20s anymore. It's catching yeah. up to me. How's, how's your marathon training going? Good, good. The only thing is uh, it's getting hot, you know, and, like, we are starting at, like, 5.30 yes. and 6 in the morning. We're going to have to either start way earlier or wait until, like, the first week in October – we have a half marathon at the end of October and then a full marathon at the end of November. So we're doing good. Like we're just we're kind of maintaining right now, um, and yeah. trying not to die from the from the eighty percent humidity we run in. Yeah. Um, but speaking I'm of which, for... Chris. Oh, go ahead. No, no, you're good. I was just saying I'm I'm training for a triathlon. It's kind of the same thing. I, I have to run oh, in the sweet. afternoon yeah. sometime, and it makes me want to die. So, and I think I yeah. am dying yeah. sometimes on running the heat. Yeah. Um, my, my running buddy, Chris, uh, I want to give a, a congratulations to him because he just recently got engaged to, to Emily hey. who is a periodic, yeah, a periodic listener to the, the podcast as well. Congratulations. And, um, 
Yeah, and then two weeks after he marries Chris, my mom will be marrying his dad. Whoa. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. My mom will be Man. marrying Bob. And we all live in the same neighborhood. And uh, so Chris wow. will become my stepbrother. Yeah, and Bob will become my stepdad. <laughs> so it's like that's that's kind of cool, man. Bob the yeah, suitor is, is. will now become Bob the stepdad. Yeah. So everybody's engaged, ready to ready to tie the knot. The next couple months are going to be a lot of a lot of marrying and giving in marriage. Yeah, man. Are you going to be officiating your uh, your mom's wedding, or I'm? I offered, and I said I would be honored to, but. Um, I think she just would. She would prefer I just sit back and be a be a spectator, which I do. I probably would yeah. prefer, um, but also I think yeah. she's worried I I will royal, just royally screw it up, and I, <laughs> I don't want to do that. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's cool, man. It would be weird too. It'd be like, hey, um, you know, this weekend I'm actually marrying my mom. You know, it's like yeah. it just sounds, you know. <laughs> I mean, it is Alabama. Well, you do. I was about to say, roll tide. I mean, you do have that going for you. Yeah, Uh, yeah. Wow, that's that's amazing. Well, that's awesome, man. I'm happy for your mom. Happy for uh, uh, Chris. Trying to think of his name. Yeah, yeah. That's really cool. Well, our episode this week is one that has been on my heart and on my mind quite a bit because I am teaching through the book of First Peter at our church mm. and um a couple of weeks ago i was preaching through first peter 3 and we came across this verse it says in your hearts set apart christ is lord always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you the reason for the hope that you have but do this with gentleness and respect that's first peter three fifteen. and so i was really thinking about that and started having some conversations with people about what that verse means, giving a answer to everyone who asks for the reason for the hope that you have and doing it with general respect. And one of the things I discovered as uh, I was sitting around with a small group the other night is that this is a very intimidating um, command from God's word. I think some mm-hmm. people feel very ill-equipped to give an answer Um when people are asking them on the fly, like, hey, why do you believe what you believe? And so it kind of led me down a path of thinking, man, I, I really love to maybe talk about that and give people some resources to, to maybe help them get equipped. So, um, yeah, so that's what we're going to do tonight. Gabe, have you ever um, had conversations with folks like that, that maybe when they think about that idea of giving reasons for their faith, maybe they feel overwhelmed or maybe they feel unequipped? With that as well? Yeah, yeah. People would rather, um, well, it's kind of twofold. Like people feel feel uh, like a lack of confidence in, in defending their faith and ex- fully explaining and articulating their faith. But also we live in a very non-conflictual culture and world and age right now. So people feel like if they're going to express uh, their belief and their faith and their, their convictions, which is if, if you're a Christian, it's a very exclusive one, um, meaning like, it, it basically says, I'm in the right, <laughs> and if you're not right. part of our faith, you're in the wrong. It doesn't matter what faith you're a part of. Um, and people sure. feel like, I think this is an age in our culture that is um, it's a little bit overly abrasive to many people. And so, yeah, it's hard to get people to come out of their shell and, and have that confidence, but also feel like, hey, the, the gospel is conflictual. Now, it does it with like meekness and respect and gentleness, but it is conflictual. And in that conflict, it's actually, it's actually really beneficial. Is the word conflictual a word? You keep using it. I've never heard that word before. Let's Google mm. it. Mm. Okay. Let's see. Am I Googling or you? <laughs> I, just want, I just want to make sure. I'm going to Google it real quick. Conflictual. Conflictual. Let's see. Gabe, you were absolutely right. It is an adjective meaning characterized mm. by conflict or disagreement. Wow. Yes, you owe me you you have, steak dinner. Wow. You, you are. You were a history major when we were in college, and I was an English major, yeah. and I didn't use that word. Wow. Um, I stand corrected. But you are absolutely right. It is quite conflictual because you make a truth claim. And any time yeah. you make a truth claim, what you're saying is, this is true, therefore other things are false. Mm-hmm. So as Christians, when we say 
Christ is Lord, what we're saying is there are other worldviews, there are other viewpoints about the divine and about reality that are untrue. Mm -hmm. And I think because we live in a day and age of relative truth and relative reasoning, um, we don't like that. But there's some logical fallacies behind us not liking that, and I'll, I'll, we'll unpack those as we go along. But yeah, I think you're right. It is conflictual, to use our new $10,000 word. Do, do you think people just don't want to be perceived as mean? Do you think that's why people have a hard time giving an answer? That they don't want to call anybody out yeah. or yeah it seems like in our culture like uh conflict or disagreement with someone's views is seen on par with physical violence and hatred mm. and and actually like that's ironically the the opposite can be true um because what we end up doing in a society that that embraces that concept is embracing everyone's fallacies and they can be not even pretending to religion or faith they could just be like logical fallacies and if you're right. if you go along with that and embrace everyone's logical fallacies you're actually um <laughs> you're you're actually more selfish uh than you are loving because you're you're so in your selfishness you're afraid to correct their logical fallacy or their fallacy about the what what their worldview is and that's actually that's actually selfishness um, right. So yeah, we got to kind of break out of that paradigm that that you know our culture right now is being sucked down into, in order to to really mm. get through some of this stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think the whole idea to behind disagreeing with people and maybe debating with people and things like that, um, we're uncomfortable with that. But truthfully, that's how we find truth. Is like having conversations with people and we're persuaded and we're convinced and we grapple with our preconceived ideas and that's how we arrive at truth. And I think some of us are very nervous to do that, but I think there's a way we can do that with, like the word says, gentleness and respect. So um, mm -hmm. th this, this field of study, and it really is a field of study, I mean, you get a whole degree on it, is called Christian apologetics. And... That word apologetics actually comes from the Greek word that we read about in 1 Peter 3.15 where he says, be prepared uh, to give an apologia. Um, we translate in our English Bibles, give an answer, but really the word is apologia, and it basically means a defense. Um, a reasonable, persuasive, and rational defense. Um, and apologias were presented most often in Greek culture in courts of law. So you'd see attorneys giving apologias, um, basically stating your case. You know, okay, so you think this person is innocent. Why are they innocent? Well, the attorney would step up and give an apologia. Here's my case. I'm, they're innocent for this reason, this reason, this reason, this reason. <clears throat> and so Christian apologetics is really the science of giving either a defense of the Christian faith from those who are attacking it or a logical, rational, and persuasive explanation of the Christian faith uh, for other people in order to persuade them. So yep. that's kind of what it is. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is used throughout um, the latter portions of the book of Acts. And Paul is on trial. I think he goes to trial like three different times uh, mm -hmm. before different, different, different rulers and governors, you know, uh, towards the end of the book of Acts. In like Acts 24, 10, he says like, you know, I am I am here uh, making my apologia, making my defense of why why I'm on trial and what I believe in. So, and every time that he does that, those of those three times, he doesn't um, he doesn't really defend himself. He just explains mm -hmm. and expounds upon what he believes. Uh, and it's and he yeah. kind of goes through like this chronological um, retelling of, of a lot of Israel's history and scripture, and then he gets to the point where here we are now. The Messiah was sent, he was betrayed, and you guys had him executed like a criminal. <laughs> and uh, right, right, right. And yeah, that's how it, that's his apologia, his his defense. Hmm. Yeah, and it's interesting. Um, I think there's a lot of people when they think about Christian apologetics, they think about it's more of a defense of them instead of a defense mm -hmm. of the ideas, right? And so it's interesting how you, you you noted that Paul did not really defend himself. It was really, he was like, okay, I'm on mm -hmm. trial for 
the claims of Christianity. So let's talk about that first, right? Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of Christians who truthfully are pretty insecure. Um, I think all of us as human beings, we've got our own insecurities. But those of us who really, I think, wrestle with insecurities because we're called gullible or naive or stupid, um, for us, the field of apologetics feels like, hey, we're defending ourselves, right? And mm -hmm. um, sadly, man, there's a lot of movements in Christianity that don't really teach people to have rational, objective evidences for the faith. It's very much just, hey, feel it, you know, feel it in your mm -hmm. heart, which our faith has an experiential element to it. But I think in a, in a large part, we've dropped the ball at really explaining to people, here's some rational evidences for the Christian faith. And so when skeptics show up and start to ask people, why do you believe what you believe? They don't really have an answer because it's like, well, I've, I've I felt it one time in a church service or I, this is how I grew up or I went to a Christian school or my parents are Christians or, um, and so, yeah. And I don't think that that really cuts it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So skeptics will bring up questions and objections centered around the existence of God, the exclusivity of the Christian gospel, and, and we will unpack kind of those two tonight a little bit, um, but really we're just kind of scratching the surface, the surface or the scurface. That's a good word. Scr scratching the surface. Uh, <laughs> skeptics will bring up objections for the inspiration, inerrancy, and infallibility of Scripture. Like, why do you believe the Bible? Um, and a lot of Christians say, well, because the Bible says it's God's word, but that's kind of circular reasoning. That doesn't work with a skeptic. Um, the existence of miracles, namely the resurrection of Jesus or the miracles listed in the Bible. Um, skeptics will often bring up, and this one is a very interesting one, uh, that I, I see keyboard warriors bringing up quite a bit, contradictions in the biblical text. So, uh, on our YouTube channel, not Beards and Bible YouTube channel, but our church's YouTube channel with, the uh, most recent first Peter teaching, I was talking about having an answer for your faith and somebody brought up, well, you know, the Bible endorses slavery. Um, mm. And that's kind of become, I think for, for some skeptics, like the, the ultimate ace of spades, mm -hmm. uh, the Bible endorses genocide, the Bible endorses rape. Um, so, you know, therefore all of Christianity, because it was based on a biblical text that endorses these evil things, has to be absolute hogwash because it's contradictory. Um, mm. Skeptics will sometimes say the Bible was significantly altered and changed throughout history. Um, or the Bible has no historical backing or evidence. So it's basically just mythology. It's folklore. It's fable. It's fairy tale, that kind of thing. Um, some skeptics argue from a philosophical standpoint. So if God is all powerful and God is all good, why is there evil in the world? You know, why doesn't God just stop earthquakes and tsunamis? You say he's all powerful and you say he's all good. Well, either he's impotent because he can't stop earthquakes and tsunamis or he's a monster because he won't. Um, and then we talked about this in our evolution episode a couple of years ago, contradictions between science and Christianity. A lot of skeptics bring those up. So did I miss anything or is that, do you think those are pretty much the no, ones Yeah, that covers a lot of those bases. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so um, a Christian who's been trained in apologetics knows how to do kind of three different things. The first is they know why they believe and what they believe. So they have drawn logical conclusions about reality based on evidence. So the reason they believe in Jesus is not just because they've had a personal experience and encounter with Jesus, which when we come to faith in Christ, we do, but because they understand there's evidence about reality that points to the person of Jesus. And they have looked at the evidence. They've looked at how that builds a case for the Christian worldview and, and the person of Jesus. And so, yeah, they, they understand, okay, I believe this, and there's reasons for why I believe this. 
so that's kind of the most important skill for any Christian that wants to get into apologetics is knowing why they believe what they believe. Um, the second skill is knowing how to share what they believe with others in a reasonable, intelligent, and persuasive manner, and then how to defend what they believe from attacks against others. And that's probably the most intimidating part of Christian apologetics. Because, mm-hmm. I mean, you can sit there and, you know, read the book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist by Norman Geisler, which is a big, fat, and massive textbook, you know, the size of an encyclopedia. And you can read The Case for Christ, and you can watch lectures by, you know, William, Craig Lake, William Lane Craig, and, 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 you know, like binge all that, and yes, and amen to all that, and so have all the content, but then you have no idea when you get in a very emotionally charged conversation with a family member at Thanksgiving and they do not believe what you believe. Oh, wow. Like, how do I do that? Mm -hmm. And that's, I think the most overwhelming and intimidating part of this. Have you found that to be true in your own life? Yeah. I mean, just today I was having a conversation with a guy, uh, at work. It's like, um, he grew up he grew up in Christianity all his life and now when I finally kind of got around to asking him okay so so what describe to me your worldview like what would you describe yourself and he's like I'm an atheist atheistic nihilist and I'm like mm. okay so you're 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 hopeless and without god <laughs> 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 which is funny wow. because like I'm like so do you really believe that like do you believe that there's just there's no point to our existence and he's like yeah and i was like no you don't i was like no you don't believe that so like, why are you working it? a I job it. i was like yeah exactly i was like well, why it's exactly what i asked him i was like so why are you why are you here right now why are you working he's like because well because i gotta pay the bills and i gotta feed my family well why you gotta feed your family because i love that i love and he's like <laughs> you can tell he's just like oh wait a second and I was like, so you love your family. Why would you love your family? You know, like, what's the point of that? That seems really inconvenient. So it started a really good conversation. And, um, yeah. but yeah, it, 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 but eventually it turned into, um, a, a tax, a t- slights towards the, uh, my faith, you know? And, um, right. yeah, that's, that's fine. You know, that that's, that's totally acceptable. And, and ultimately a lot of apologetics comes down to having a lot of discernment when you're communicating with people. Mm-hmm. And there are people who genuinely, have reasoned their way uh, away from God. They have taken their their logic and used their brains and have, I would say, erroneously lo- reasoned their way from away from God. But then there is the people who have been hurt by someone who claimed to be a representative of God. Yes. And they have felt their way away from God. Yeah. Um, yeah. By and large, I would say as upwards of 80% of the people I've ever com- communicated with and shared the gospel with and that are any degree antagonistic towards my faith it's because they have been deeply hurt by someone who has been a person of faith um and yeah, you have to have absolutely. discernment when communicating with those people you just have to kind of feel it out a little bit and say okay i see i see you don't you don't need reason you need an you need an apology um, right so yeah that's that's my my experiences absolutely well it's interesting you brought that up you know some people do have for real intellectual obstacles a lot of people mm-hmm. probably more people than we realize have emotional obstacles. And then I think a mm-hmm. third category is people who have volitional obstacles. And that is a matter of the will. Like if this is true, mm-hmm. it has to change how I live and I don't want to change how I live. So I would rather this just not be true. And, and I think there's a lot of people that are there, right? Yeah, so yeah. that's the second skill of apologetics. How do you talk to people like that? How do you, how do you like, interact with them in such a way that you can you can tactically kind of carry on those conversations in offering them things to believe even as they're maybe in being antagonistic towards you but really the third skill in apologetics is how to carry on these conversations with gentleness and respect um mm-hmm. so the apologist gregory kokel has a great line he says if anybody gets mad in the conversation the christian loses so mm. if the Christian gets mad, then the Christian begins to act emotional and perhaps maybe not as rational as they need to, and they start to misrepresent mm-hmm. Christ. And if the non-believer gets mad, then um, their shields go up and they stop mm-hmm. listening 
um, and it starts being yeah. less about the, this topic at hand. Well, case in point, like as I'm having this conversation with a guy and, and asking him, I have a tendency to get a little bit too intense sometimes in these kinds of conversations. So I've learned to kind of dial back sometimes. So like I'm saying, well, why, why are you working for your family? Why are you feeding your family? And he goes, cause I love them, you know? And, and I said, well, why do you love them? And I, and I stopped. And before he could answer that question, I said, by the way, I love and admire you for working hard for your family. I think that's an awesome quality. You, you're a really hardworking guy. And then I say, I, I just put the conversation on pause. And then I switched gears and said, by the way, how many kids do you have? And then he answered the question, what are their names? And then he answered the question, oh, that's so cool. How mm. old are they, you know? And I was, so that I almost go on the sidebar conversation, getting to know him and genuinely interested in yeah. his family and sure. learning about the people who he loves. And then if the conversation comes back five minutes later to apologetics, great. If it doesn't, it probably will tomorrow. But yeah, right. that's exactly right. When emotion, you can feel the emotion start to kind of get a little bit tense. It's time to kind of like back off a little bit and and just kind of let you know let them process some some things that you already threw out there. Right. And uh, you know, yeah. save it for next week or whatever. Absolutely. Well, to quote Gregory Kokel again, he says in every. Which by the way, he wrote a great book called Tactics. So a lot of stuff we're going to talk about tonight is from that book. But he says that his goal in every spiritual conversation he has is just to give someone a pebble in their shoe. So mm, he's like, I'm mm. not trying to make a sale. I'm not trying to, you know, lead them in the sinner's prayer, like immediately. Right. I'm, I'm just trying to give them something to think about that they mm. have a hard time dismissing easily, like a pebble in their shoe. Like you're walking along and you're like, man, I, really good. I keep thinking about that, you know? And so, um, yeah, that's, that's really important to keep in mind that we have to have these kind of conversations with gentleness and respect because we're trying to win the person. We're not trying to win an argument, right? Mm. And so if we just see it, man, I'm winning an argument. Really, I think the, the Christians that get into apologetics because they want to win an argument are the, probably the most insecure Christians um, mm. that themselves wrestle with doubt. And so they think that their doubts can be dealt with kind of through the back door by getting into arguments with people. Yeah. Um, I don't think that's a good reason to get into apologetics. So yeah, that's just yeah. me. So we're going to look through, um, those three skills and kind of unpack those tonight and give a brief, very, 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 very brief scratching the surface, um, primer in Christian apologetics. And I'm going to be recommending books the whole time because I believe you need to be a reader if you care about Christian apologetics. Um, like I said, there's whole degrees. You can get a doctorate in Christian apologetics. Um, you don't have to get a doctorate in Christian apologetics, but I do think it's good to maybe pick up a book and um, read one or two books about it. So, mm. Dave, what's the best apologetics book you've ever read? Hmm. I'd have to think about that for a little bit, but I, I will say... Right off my head, there are some great apologists on YouTube. Um, Frank Turek is one. Mm -hmm. He's phenomenal. He's um, great. Yeah. Uh, Jeff Durbin from Apologia mm -hmm. Studios, actually. Um, those oh, those are guys there's I the really word. Yeah. admire. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, those two guys are, are, are amazing at what they do. And um, uh, I'd say Frank Turek in particular does a, f a phenomenal job at answering very heady questions that people present with it, present to him, but doing it in a very kind of a humorous and many times like self debasing way. That's that really mm -hmm. wins those people over. Yeah. It's very winsome and lighthearted and keeps the conversation very engaging. He's not mm -hmm. preaching to anybody, you know? Um, I would think probably in this sounds surprising because most people wouldn't see this as a book about apologetics, but the book mere Christianity by CS Lewis is mm -hmm. um, actually a very convincing case for the Christian faith. So if uh, you've never read it, I'd say that's a really good place to start. But All right, so let's get into these three skills. Uh, first skill of Christian apologetics is knowing why we believe what we believe. So a lot of skeptics that come against Christian 
worldview and Christian teachings and Christian belief systems, you know, their attack is basically Christians are unintelligent. Christians are naive. Christians are gullible. And the reason they are all those things is because they very blindly put their faith into a belief system that has zero logical evidence. Um, so Christians are, you know, hoping in some magical old book that tells stories about, you know, whales that eat people and talking donkeys and, um, <laughs> you know, people that can walk on water and that kind of thing. So it's like, okay, Christians have to be the dumbest people on planet earth, right? You can't possibly believe something that outlandish, right? Um, mm -hmm. And then other skeptics will say, there's just not enough evidence out there. Like, you you can think what you want about Jesus, but like you making Jesus your Lord, there's just not enough evidence out there about Jesus to bother with that. So just kind of embrace your own understanding of that or don't worry about it. There's no reason to believe or even worry about the question of God or the question of Jesus. Um, and I would think those people would describe themselves as agnostics. Mm -hmm. So the two things that we'll kind of zero in on tonight are the existence of God, you know, reasons for why we believe in the existence of God, and then reasons for why the claims of Jesus are compelling. So when you start talking about the existence of God, there's three main arguments for the existence of God. And the first of that is the cosmological reason. So cosmology is the study of the origin of the universe. So does this sound familiar, Gabe? Cosmological mm -hmm. cosmology. Not cosmetologist yeah. view. That's making the universe mm -hmm. pretty if you're a cosmetologist. Cosmologist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what what do you understand about the cosmological reason? Like why would that be an evidence for the existence of God? Well, the cosmological reason just it basically looks at the universe and its expansiveness and ask the question uh where did all this come from <laughs> you know right, what is right, the right. source of all of this um what was here before us and mm -hmm. they're out, outside of of a theist worldview there is no logical explanation for that um either, well, what if somebody uh, said what, what if somebody said well the big bang right so mm -hmm. obviously everything that we see now came into existence through the Big Bang. Checkmate, mm -hmm. you dumb Christian. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what do you what do you say yeah, to that? Yeah. Well, yeah, it's like yeah, you could say well that that takes a lot of first of all the Big Bang takes a lot of energy, right? And and energy doesn't create itself. Something has to create energy, and also the Big Bang took a lot of matter. You know, the Big Bang, Big right. Bang theorists believe that all the matter in the universe condensed down. Uh, to to um, be able to fit down onto the tip of an ink pen, and then that's uh, once energy was applied to that, that's what created this massive explosion, which created all the stars in our universe and sun and everything else. And it's like you stop and think about that for a second. It's like, wait, you know, where did all that come from? You know, and it's like that's right, 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 it's right. Still, it's still just going in circles, um, and they right. know that, but it's just. You know, it's a matter of just like, okay, let's just take your legs out from under you on that one because that's, that's right. not a good logical explanation. Yeah, so the, the cosmological reason is probably the most basic argument for the existence of God, right? So mm -hmm. modern science confirms the universe, the universe had a beginning. So the question is, okay, what caused that beginning? How did everything that we see come from nothing and no one? Because logically, scientifically, rationally, that makes zero sense. Mm -hmm. And so that's a huge problem for someone that holds to an atheistic worldview. There is no God. Okay, where did everything come from, right? If the answer is nothing or no one, okay, you got some explaining to do, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's the cosmological reason. Um, then there's the teleological reason. And... This comes from the, a Greek word that basically means like design. So if you and I were, Gabe, let's imagine. Let's imagine for a second. Are you ready to imagine? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Let's imagine. You and I are walking on the beach at night, right? 
and there's a there's a gentle ocean breeze blowing in and uh you've taken off your flip-flops i'm still wearing mine with socks just because i don't like the feeling of sand beneath my toes uh and all of a sudden a very elaborate watch gets washed up on the ocean and we we bend down and pick it up from the surf and we look and man this is like a very elaborate swiss watch that has all of these intricate details carved into the the metal and it's got all the different parts and everything like that and i look at it and i'm like man this is a really amazing clock whoever designed and built this clock had to be very 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 intelligent and then you looked at me and said what makes you think that there was some sort of a creator or designer to this watch that doesn't it make sense that all the different parts making up that watch were out in this ocean and they somehow over a long period of time came together to form this elaborate watch hmm. and it's a very silly axiom that would never happen, but essentially, this is what people who hold to a materialist and atheistic worldview believe about the universe. Right? Yeah. Yeah, when in reality, like our human bodies, and like you have here, some of the numbers of the human eye are vastly more complicated and, and uh, complex than a little watch. Um, right. And I could read through some of these numbers. You have, you know, yeah, like do the it. eye has more than the eye has more than 2 million working parts the human eye can process 36,000 bits of information an hour the human eye can see 2.7 million different colors and the human eye has 12 million photoreceptors and the retina wow. inside the human eye contains 130 million rods for night vision and 7 million color sensitive cones for day vision so way more complex and and uh designed than our Swiss wash up, wash up, wash up on the beach for us. Yeah. And, and so like, uh, there's a British molecular biologist named is Michael Denton. He wrote a book called nature's destiny. He says this, this is a very fascinating quote. He says, whether one accepts or rejects the intelligent design hypothesis, there's no avoiding the conclusion that the world looks as if it has been tailored for life. It appears to have been designed. All reality appears to be a vast, coherent, teleological whole with life and mankind as its purpose and goal. Hmm. So, man, science, specifically biology, so if you start looking at, like, our circulatory system, like Gabe read some facts about the human eye, we start looking at the animal kingdom, we start looking even, like, life on the earth would not be possible if the axial tilt of the earth were greater or less if the distance of the earth from the sun were greater or less, if the earth's gravitational interaction with the moon were greater or less, if the earth's surface gravity were greater or less, if the mm -hmm. composition of the atmosphere was any different than the blend of gases we're breathing in right now, it wouldn't be possible for us to live. So to say that no one plus nothing is a result of this very intricate and perfect um, environment for life to flourish on this earth that doesn't seem reasonable or coherent at all. <clears throat> um, I had a quote by Richard Dawkins. Have you read a lot of Richard Dawkins? He's a very, I think your, your atheist nihilist friend would probably get mm -hmm. a big kick out of him. Yeah, I really resonate with this quote, yeah. yeah. Yeah, go ahead and read it. In a universe of blind physical forces and genetic replication, some people are going to get hurt, other people are going to get lucky, and if and you won't find any rhyme or reason in it, nor any justice, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference, because DNA neither knows nor cares. DNA just is, and we dance to his music. Richard Dawkins from the River Out of Eden, a Darwinian view of life. Man, that's a uh, that's a pretty depressing thought. Mm. <laughs> Like it, it just is, right? Okay, how did the human eye, the most complex organ that, you know, even, this is fascinating to me, um, Charles Darwin could not justify his view in, uh, with, with evolution with the eye. Like that was the one mm -hmm. part of any uh, life form that he was just like, I don't see how this could have evolved. 
Um, mm. And it, that just stumped him, right? Um, Interesting. So really, the, the teleological reason for existence in God is like when we observe the complexity of the universe, is it more reasonable to assume that all of it came about because of sheer chance? Like Richard Dawkins, just blind, pitiless indifference of DNA. Or is it more reasonable to assume that it was intelligently created and designed? Does that make sense? Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the third reason for the existence of God is called the moral reason. And um, every person in every culture on planet Earth recognizes that some things are right and some things are wrong. And the irony, I think, of many people who hold to an atheistic and naturalistic worldview is they call God evil, which is a bit ironic because if there were no God, there'd mm -hmm. be no such thing as evil. But that's, I think, the, the irony that is lost on many people. Um, so every time we argue over what is right and what is wrong, what we're doing is appealing to a higher law that we assume everyone is aware of, everyone holds to, and everyone is not free to just arbitrarily change it, right? Mm. So if mm. I say to you, lying is wrong, we, we both kind of agree and have an understanding that lying is not something you should be doing. And pretty much in every culture everywhere, we kind of agree, right? Uh, murder is wrong. And what's interesting is it's wrong for us as humans if we're getting in an argument about a shopping cart at Walmart for me to pull up my 45 and shoot a guy. But then if two lions get a fight going at the watering hole over a gazelle carcass and one of them kills the other lion, that's not called a homicide. <laughs> right? So yeah. humanity holds to a moral law a higher standard and so that higher standard that law requires a lawgiver because that moral law transcends humanity and so an universal law requires a universal lawgiver so anytime somebody says you should do this or you shouldn't do this they're implying this belief in absolute morality but if there is no god there is no creator we are the products of evolutionary uh, progression and natural selection. Who's to say what's right? Who's to say what's wrong? Who's sh who's to say what I should do or, or what I shouldn't do? Mm -hmm. So that view kind of collapses um, when when someone holds to the fact that there is no God and yet there is right and wrong. Yeah, and then it boils down to basically. Uh, you, know, you can pin people down on like, yeah, it's it's governments that decide what is right and what is wrong, or it's our own selves, our own hearts. You know, love decides what is right and what is wrong, and you know, from there it's like, okay, so was the United States of America moral in its legalization of slavery? Was the Third mm. Reich moral in its? Uh, you know, annihilation of 11 million men, women, and children in the 1930s and 40s, because those right. were well-established, publicly, popularly elected governments. And mm. yeah, you kind of take people down these, and eventually you have to get to the point where it's like, well, I don't know what's right and wrong. I don't, I have no idea who gets to define it. And you could say, well, in your worldview, it's, it really comes down to he who has the biggest guns and the most money, they call the shots. Right. In my worldview, yeah. it's unchanging. It is the God of the universe who gets to define that. Mm. And that's unchanging. That's true. Well, I think most people deep down recognize the existence in a moral law that is universal. It's just most people are very hesitant to admit it. Mm -hmm. Right? It's, it's yeah. hard for them to say, okay, yes, you're right. We all know that murdering is wrong. Okay, so where does that come from, right? It logically can't come from evolutionary natural selection, right? Um, because right. if evolutionary natural selection is the reality of the human race, then what Nazi Germany did should actually be applauded because they were thinning the herd. They were getting rid of the people who were weak and people who were 
stymieing the master race, right? Right, right. So it, it's, it's quite irrational to hold to a worldview that says no one plus nothing equals everything we see because the reality does not confirm that thesis, right? So it doesn't mean Christians are dumb for believing that there is a God. It actually is the most coherent and rational view of reality that there is to say that there is a higher power. There is a creator God who designed life on earth and who gave us a moral law, wrote, wrote it in our hearts, uh, the book of Romans says, and this is why we have consciences. Yeah. Um, so how about Jesus, right? There's a lot of people that say, okay, yeah, so I believe in God. There is some sort of a higher power, right? I just don't believe in Jesus. And if you believe in Jesus, you're kind of dumb. Well, kind of two thoughts in terms of the person of Jesus. The first is this. There is virtually a unanimous consensus among scholars that there was a real historical figure named Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth deliberately stood and spoke in the place of God himself. He claimed that in himself the kingdom of God had come. And he carried out a ministry of miracle working and exorcisms as signs of that fact. Many people who are skeptics and cynics will throw out unsubstantiated claims that there is no historical evidence for the historical Jesus. It is a unanimous consensus among responsible historians and scholars that there was a real historical Jesus. So we'll get here in a minute to the, um, to the thing of somebody just can't claim something without providing evidences for why they believe it, right? So somebody says, well, there's no such thing as a historical Jesus. A follow-up question was, well, how did you come to that conclusion? Because what you find out is mm -hmm. they heard it from someplace that wasn't credible. Yeah, man, even secular atheist historians will say, no, there's a consensus that there was a real Jesus. And if you start doubting that there's no historical Jesus, then you've got to say, okay, there was no George Washington, there was no Abraham Lincoln, there was no... Right. I mean, it's a, <laughs> we have no reason to believe anything yeah. in history if we say there's no Jesus. Right. So really the question is, okay, who was this man and what should we make of the claims of Jesus and Nazareth? Um, really we have three options and this is CS Lewis from his book, mere Christianity. He was either a liar because he claimed to be God. He was a lunatic because he thought he was God <laughs> Or he was the Lord. He, he is God, right? So it is irrational and incoherent with the person of Jesus to say, well, I believe he was a good teacher, but I don't believe he's God. Because good teachers don't say that they're God, right? Uh, mentally ill people who claim to be God, you don't say they're a good teacher, right? <laughs> right. So that's kind of the first thought. Okay, who is this Jesus, right? And you've got to, you've got to like wrestle and grapple with who is this Jesus, that history. All of human history, as we know it, hinges upon this figure. Because we've got BCE, 6,000 years of human history, or excuse me, about 4,000 years of human history, BCE. And then we have CE, or AD, right? 2,000 years of human history. Who is that figure that hinged all of human history, Right? B.C. and A.D. or B.C.E. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. A.C.E. Um, yeah. There's also a number of evidences supporting some of these radical claims that Jesus made about himself, but mainly that he would rise from the dead. So the evidences for the resurrection of Jesus are after his crucifixion, Jesus was interred in a tomb by Joseph of Arimathea, and you can actually go into the garden tomb in the city of Jerusalem. The, and, and it's interesting, Joseph of Arimathea, his name is mentioned in the gospel accounts almost as if to say to the people who are reading it, this is a real person that people would have known, right? Um, mm -hmm. The tomb of Jesus was found empty by a group of women on a Sunday morning, which is fascinating for two reasons. 
Number one, if you're going to start a religion in the first century, you would never put women as your first eyewitnesses because there was exceptional misogyny in the first century. Women's witnesses and testimonies were seen as unreliable, right? Mm. But not only the gospel accounts give women as the first witnesses, they also list the names of the women as if to say these women are still alive, you can go ask them. Uh, various individuals and groups of people on multiple occasions and under different circumstances saw appearances of Jesus alive after his death, including at one point 500 people at one time. That's what the book of 1 Corinthians tells us. So, like, why is that significant? I heard the wheels in your head turning for a second. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it really does boil down to the validity of the resurrection our faith really hinges on that. Um, yeah. And I think Paul, Paul picks up on that and Paul says, you know, like this is a big deal. Like if, if he is, if he's not risen then all of this is, is nonsense. It's a waste. And that's, mm-hmm. it's really fascinating that all the gospel writers go above and beyond to describe post resurrection sightings and interactions. Um, it is one of the most well attested for, and most significant events in human history. Um, it's it's just absolutely prolific. Like you said, you mentioned earlier, it split th- our reckoning of time, at least in the West, and I would say the vast majority of the world, it split it completely in half. Um, mm. it's, it's very significant. And I would say if you need a, if you, if you need apologetics, if you, if there's one tool I want you to have in your tool belt when it comes to apologetics, it's learning how to, learning to understand and defend the resurrection of Christ. Yeah. Yep. And, and honestly, that's, that is the primary evidence we have as believers for the person of Jesus, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because there are so many evidences in our world, in the broad daylight of human history, that say real historical Jesus claimed he would rise from the dead. And then we have the birth of the church Mm -hmm. to where by 350 AD, 10% of the Roman empire was Christian. So how do you explain the birth of that movement? Especially when none of the people who were espousing those claims that Jesus rose from the dead, they didn't have anything to gain from it. They didn't have any money to make from it. They didn't have any power to gain from it. Um, as a matter of fact, actually, most of them, they were threatened with death, imprisonment, beating, and all, almost all of his 12 disciples died for their claim that Jesus rose from the dead. So why would they go to their graves holding to that claim if it was a mythology, if it was wishful thinking? So you have to explain away the resurrection if you refuse to examine it. So that's a very powerful apologetic for the uh, person of Jesus. So, so that's first skill. <laughs> and man, we just looked at two. <laughs> we could literally spend like four hours unpacking this, right? Um, we just looked at two different things that skeptics might bring up: the the existence of God and evidence for Jesus, right? But I mean. There are so many books out there that help people with things like um, what do you do about the inerrancy and availability of scripture, the existence of miracles, contradicts in the biblical text. So uh, I would encourage you if you want to know more about that before we move on and we're going to have to fly through these next few, um, pick up a good book, man. Um, a couple of good books. I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. That's Norman Geisler and Frank Turek, I think, contributed with that one. Mm-hmm. The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel, that's a really good one. More Than a Carpenter by Josh McDowell is a really good one. Um, like I mentioned, Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis, those are all great ones to kind of know why we believe what we believe. Are we ready for skill two? Yeah, that's it. All right, so skill two, how to share what we believe with others in a reasonable, intelligent, and persuasive manner and how to defend what we believe from attacks. So I mentioned a guy named Greg Kokel earlier. He has a great book I've been reading called Tactics. 
And it's not so much the content of apologetics, like why we believe what we believe, but the book is rather like, how do you have those conversations? And so I mentioned earlier, his rule is if anybody gets mad, the Christian loses, right? And we don't look to make a sell in every interaction or just look to, you know, I'm going to share the gospel with this person and lead them in the sinner's prayer in five minutes, right? We're looking to put a stone in their shoe. So rather than us being confrontational or just stating truth claims and come up to somebody and saying, hey, um, you're going to hell without Jesus. Can I pray with you a prayer to get you saved, right? We <laughs> engage them in thoughtful dialogue through using questions. Mm -hmm. And if someone is making an attacking statement towards Christianity, we can give a defense by asking them questions. And so, um, you know, engaging in spiritual conversations, I mean, it, it's his, I loved what you, uh, how did you start the conversation with that guy today at your work? You said he grew up in church and you asked him a couple questions about, what did you say to get that started? Um, yeah, I just said, yeah, it's interesting. And, you know, he said, he said, yeah, I've, I've read the Bible through multiple times, cover to cover. And then I started it. Well, what did you learn from it? Uh, I learned hmm. that I still have a lot of questions and then, um, and then it turned into, okay, so it's interesting. So if you've read that multiple times, I'm curious, you know, and I said, are you familiar with the term worldview? And I was like, you know, like a worldview is like how you see the world around you and make sense of events and and our existence. And he's like, yeah, I think so. And I said, well, how would you describe your worldview? What would you say you are? And uh, hmm. then that's when he described it. So yeah, you know, just that's, that's kind of a shoe in for, for, yeah. for some people, you know, and yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great one. You know, just kind of like, Hey, how'd you grow up? Or, you know, would you consider yourself a spiritual person or, you know, Hey, I noticed you have a cross around your neck. Like, what does that mean to you? You know, those things. Mm -hmm. Um, so for someone who attacks Christianity, Greg Kokel has a very interesting tactic, um, and he calls it the Columbo tactic. So this is from the old TV show Columbo. Uh, you remember Columbo? He was the detective that mm -hmm. seemed really innocent and kind of bumbling sometimes, but he was always, you know, very, very congenial and warm, and everybody saw him as completely harmless but he would always ask questions and those pesky questions were usually what led to him cracking the case because he was just so relentless in asking questions and then he would catch people a lot of times in contradictions by asking questions and mm -hmm. so greg Kokel gives two colombo questions and the first colombo question is hey what do you mean by that right so um let's see Somebody is hanging out with you and they say something like, well, I mean, you, you can't trust the Bible because it was written by men. So as a Christian, you might ask, huh, well, what do you mean by that? You trust your encyclopedia because it was written by men. You trust a dictionary because it was written by men. You trust a lot of textbooks because they were written by men. Um, why is it that the Bible's unreliable because there were human authors that were used to write it? I'm confused about that. Can you clear that up for me? And so really what it is is like <laughs> you are trying to clarify that person's worldview, but you're also trying to clarify what that person is saying by kind of cutting through the inflammatory and um, maybe even inciting comment that they made to try to get down to the real issue at hand. Like, mm -hmm. what is it specifically about the Bible that you find unreliable? Um, and so it, it's a really, I mean, it's a, it's a question anybody can do. Like, hey, what do you mean by that? And it gives you time, and but it also helps you clarify that other person's thought process. Like, what's, what's really going on, right? Mm -hmm. And then his second Columbo question is, hey, how did you come to that conclusion? So what you're doing is you're using this question to help find out why that person believes what they believe. Mm. So when someone claims an opinion like, well, you can't trust the Bible because it's written by humans. Okay. You trust other things because they're written by humans. Why can't you trust the Bible? Right. 
And then when they yeah. give you the reason for why not, that's not really an evidence. That's just their opinion. So if they make that claim, the burden of proof for providing an evidence is on them. It's not on you, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so because they made the truth claim, you didn't make a truth claim. They made a truth claim against Christianity. You are basically saying, hey, prove it, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you're, you're doing so in a very winsome congenial way you're not being a, a turd you're not being rude about it right you're just saying hey how'd you come to that conclusion like why do you think that and so kind of the the general evidence is like if somebody makes a truth claim they have to be the ones that bear the burden bear, bear the burden of proving that claim is correct not you and you can't take the bait mm -hmm. if somebody tries to shift the burden of proof to you no they made the truth claim they have to defend their position and, and really, this is a, a method called presuppositional apologetics, where really you're defending against the tax by saying, you've got to prove to me why, using evidence, that these oppositions and these objections to Christianity are, should be taken seriously. Hmm. Yeah, and a lot of, a lot of uh, talking and dialoguing with people and asking those kinds of questions um, it, people, people find that you're, if you're really interested in what they believe, like if you're genuinely interested in what they believe, they'll really mm -hmm. open up and begin to talk. And the key is that what you're trying to do is guide them through these questions. You're kind of leading the way and you're looking for them to have that aha moment where they see through your questioning that there are contradictions in what they believe. <laughs> right. And right. if you if you're good at this, you can see that in their eyes. You can mm -hmm. see their their demeanor change because they realize, wait a second, what I believe cannot hold water. And mm -hmm. there it is. There's your moment and you can at that point say checkmate or you can say, well, hey, why don't we continue this conversation over coffee or why don't we get this conversation tomorrow? And you leave that right. that pebble in their shoe overnight, you know? And then you mm -hmm. pray for them. You pray for them all evening long and the next morning. And then, you know, eventually they may come back to you and circle back to you and be like, hey, what we were talking about yesterday, you know, like it, it just kind of like nags at them and nags at them. So, yeah, but you can yeah. see that, like I said, the leading the way and showing those potential flaws in their position. That's sure. where it's at. Well. And, and I think, too, like anybody can ask questions, right? You don't have to be a Ph.D. in Christian apologetics to use Columbo right. questions, right? What you're simply doing is you're engaging somebody in a dialogue by, like you said, asking them these leading questions and saying, okay, so you said this. I'm just curious. You said this, but, like, what do you really mean by that? Because if, if this is also true, then how does that work? Like, will you, will you help me understand that? And you're not being disingenuous like you really do want to know what it is they're thinking right and mm -hmm. because people really respond well to someone who takes an interest in their ideas chances are they'll be eager to tell you what they're thinking right um but then like to be honest if you do this often enough you're probably going to meet somebody that actually knows more than you do about a topic and you're going to mm -hmm. get overmatched and so if that ever happens like a, a good piece of advice is don't try to argue your case or engage somebody in an area where they clearly know more than you do. Like a gracious way is giving them credit for expressing very interesting ideas. Thank them and say, Hey, I, I might need to study this more. Thanks for giving me something to think about. I'd love to carry on our conversation in another time. Yeah. Um, and no harm, no foul there. You you've represented Christ well, and you've given people pebbles and shoes and, uh, yeah, you don't you don't have to feel like if you didn't lead someone in a sinner's prayer, you failed somehow, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, as we land the plane, let's talk about the last skill of Christian apologetics, and this is one I think that a lot of folks interested in Christian apologetics struggle with probably the most. I think the first two are the ones that get all the press time, and the last one doesn't really get talked about. And that is how to tactfully carry on these kind of conversations with gentleness and respect. 
And I said this earlier, I think for a lot of us, the reason we don't engage in spiritual conversations is because our own insecurity and pride are at stake. And we don't want to quote unquote lose. So that's why we get so angry and that's why we get so upset because we're kind of afraid that if we lose an argument, then that means that we're stupid, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but our objective is never to win an argument. It's to win that person. That's when the win of the Lord. Mm-hmm. So we have to use a bit of emotional intelligence and spiritual discernment to kind of assess if that person is even receptive or open to having a reasonable conversation about the Christian faith before we even start down that path, right? Um, because, man, there's some people that, you said this earlier, Gabe, they have such emotional baggage connected. Mm-hmm. They are so combative and they're so argumentative. There's there's really not a whole lot of sense in trying to give them something to think about because they're not ready at that point. Mm-hmm. How, how do you discern that? Like, what are some red flags that you look for? And you're like, yeah, this is not, not going to go well before we even start. <laughs> well, I think it's, like you said, just a lot of it is using discernment. And, and the Holy Spirit empowers us with discernment. Um, but another thing is just finding the right place in time. You know, when you're sharing the gospel or asking questions and having these deep conversations with you, and let's say... Uh, that person's supervisor is standing there waiting for them to get back to work or there is a skill saw running in the background and it's hard to hear them (laughs) and understand them. You know, it's just like all the, you want to make sure you want to make sure that there is ample time that you're not robbing this person of their time, you know, and they're not robbing their employer of their time. Um, I've seen that happen where someone will grab a a server at a restaurant and sit there and try to have an hour long conversation with them about their Mm. worldview. Meanwhile, they've got all these other tables they need to be serving and doing. Um, So it's important you kind of, you make sure that they're relaxed. You make sure you're relaxed. But yeah, it's um, just having that, having that increased discernment um, before, you know, you don't want to get into a combative situation and argumentative situation. Um, But I think it's important to go back and say why and ask, why is Peter telling us to have these conversations with gentleness and respect? That seems, that seems really impractical. Um, Hmm. because it'd be a lot easier just to go ahead and just like get in someone's face and start yelling at them like a drill sergeant and telling them what to believe. But why does he tell us to do that? And it's because a human being is less receptive to any sort of information or ideas if it's done with disrespect or if it's done with harshness. Um, Hmm. Whereas a person is very receptive to information and new ideas if those are presented to them with gentleness and with respect. So you can actually Hmm. turn someone away from truth. You could be speaking 100% truth and you could be just continually taking their legs out from another over and over with arguments and counter arguments. But if you're doing it with disrespect and with harshness and condescension, you're going to lose them and they're going to be hardened to that truth. Absolutely. Yeah, and remember like our objective in any conversation we have that's spiritual with someone isn't to try to make the sale um but just to give somebody a pebble in their shoe like we're planting a seed Mm -hmm. and we're loving that person and sometimes it might take dozens or maybe even hundreds of spiritual conversations for that person to have their eyes open to truth and it may not be you who has that next spiritual conversation but you've got to trust god to know that god really loves that person and god is pursuing that person too and that's that's why you're there and you're given those windows of opportunity right um Mm -hmm. but when you see that window of opportunity closing you've got to trust god to know like god i did my part when i had that window to talk to that person but send someone else along to come and water that seed that i planted Mm -hmm. um and and honestly that takes a tremendous amount of trust for us to know that that's really we can't save anybody we can't argue anybody into the kingdom. All we can do is when we have an opportunity, give a reason for the hope that we have in us, plant the seed, put the pebble in the shoe, and then release that person to God and trust that God is going to reveal himself to that person. So mm-hmm. ultimately for anyone coming to faith in Christ, there's three parties responsible. 
So Gabe, who's the first party? Well, we are the ambassador. The ambassador is the first party. We are responsible for carefully and graciously speaking truth and representing Christ. Yes. And like, that's something we got to take serious, right? So we see those windows of opportunity. We are bold. We are tactful. We are intelligent. We're coherent. We're reasonable. We do it with gentleness and respect, but like we're representing Christ and we got to keep that in mind. We're not just trying to win an argument, right? Mm-hmm. And how about the second second party responsible for someone coming to faith in Christ? Yeah, like I mentioned earlier, the Holy Spirit is not only responsible for giving you discernment, giving you boldness, giving you clarity of words and thought, but also the Holy Spirit is working on that person's heart to draw them uh, to to believe in what you are saying, to convict them of sin. Um, so the Holy Spirit is is a major player in this. I think we sometimes overlook and undermine. Absolutely. And even like, we got to trust that's the reason we're having this conversation in the first place, right? That's the reason that that person was the server uh, at our table at the restaurant because the Holy Spirit mm-hmm. was the one that was leading and setting up that conversation. And so if the Holy Spirit was faithful to put us in that person's life, the Holy Spirit's going to be faithful in putting other people in that person's life that are believers and then drawing that person's heart to the Lord. But really the last party responsible for someone coming to faith in Christ is... You know, the listener, the, uh, mm. the person you're communicating with, and they are someone who is a soul, who's, who's made in the image of God, and they have to ultimately give a response. Um, they have to hear what you're saying. They're going to receive it. And then I like to end conversations at some point with w- something like, what do you think about all this? What's your response? Mm. Yeah. And put that in their in their court and say, you know, wait, you know, do you do you agree? Do you disagree with what I've said? And it, it provokes in them they have to verbalize. Yeah, I guess you're making some good points. Or no, absolutely it's still nonsense, you know, and I've had both of those. Right, before. right, right. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's sometimes really frustrating to know that like, man, you know, the Holy Spirit is always doing his part, right? we can do our part, but ultimately, you know, every one of us have to, like, we're going to be held accountable for our responsibility to respond to the person of Jesus. And so I can't do that for anybody. You can't do that for anybody. I can't do that for you. You can't do that for me. Um, We have to respect and honor that individual's choice to either reject the person of Christ or to receive the person of Christ. And like, we are pleading with people to receive the person of Christ, but we can't do that for them. So um, I think part of this is just having faith that the Holy Spirit is uh, faithful and loving and the Holy Spirit is going to lead that person and draw that person and send people in that person's path and, and praying for that. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, man, this is heavy stuff. Yeah, covered a lot of ground. Yeah, we did. I honestly didn't think we were going to get through all this. Hmm. But we did. Somehow, some way. We did. We did. Yeah, another another episode in the books, and I hope this equips people and gives them a little bit more confidence to have these kind of discussions. Get out there and experience it. I mean, you might fall flat on your face a couple times, but um, exercise those muscles a little bit, you know? And I think the basis for any starting point, or any starting point should be, a genuine care and concern and love for that person. And they sense that, that person will sense that you have that for them and uh, you can't go wrong. 100%. And I would say too, you get better at the more you do it. So Mm -hmm. it's always funny when we've led teams to Uganda, one of the first things that we do is we will go out into villages and do evangelism. And the first time we do evangelism on the first day, um, seeing the fear and trepidation in people's hearts (laughs) like it shows up on their face like they are terrified of walking up to a complete stranger and having spiritual conversations that point them to jesus but um it's always amazing like after our first 
evangelism session at the end of the day we'll come back and people are just on fire and they're just like man i am ready to get Mm -hmm. out there and do it again i want to talk to people about jesus but it just takes breaking the ice and then us having that um you know the fear taken out of it like you can you can do this and it doesn't have to you don't have to make it weird you don't have to get into a screaming match you don't have to you know pass out tracks to somebody at barnes and noble like a weirdo you just have to be willing to be an ambassador and give people pebbles in their shoe. Right. So cool. By the way, do you remember chick tracks? No, I don't. Did, you don't remind Man. me. So I got to show you sometime. So Jack chick was an illustrator that, that would publish these, uh, really, really, really elaborate, uh, gospel tracks that were super interesting to read through and look at. And they were basically cartoons um, one of the most famous was called This Was Your Life. And uh, when I was a kid, the the barber that cut my hair was also a independent fundamental Baptist preacher. And in his barber shop, he had a whole rack of chick tracks. And uh, Interesting. they were, <laughs> so yeah, some of them were like um, all about like how the Catholic church was like, horrible and evil and probably the antichrist and the king james bible was the only bible out there and any other bible was mm. not the right bible like some of them were pretty extreme but uh yeah man i just i i collect them now so i have a whole file in my office full of chick tracks that i find and other people find for me so um kevin awesome. and shelly hotsteller who are probably listening right now they have gotten me a couple so anytime they find them they bring them to me so any listeners out there if you come across a chick track and you want to get brownie points with me Bring them to me. Bring me all your chick tracks. And I'll give you a shout out on this on the Beers and Bible podcast. So, anyway. Hey, if you got any questions or comments or feedbacks or suggestions, send us an email, beersandbiblepodcast at gmail.com. And uh, we will see you guys next time. <laughs>